Well, hello and welcome back. Uh, I am really pleased to introduce Elizabeth Rosenberg as our next keynote. Uh, for those who don't know Liz, she was confirmed last month as the Assistant Secretary for Terrorist Financing and Financial Crimes of the Treasury Department. Congratulations. Uh, leading the office that formulates and coordinates counter-terrorist financing and anti-money laundering efforts at the Department of Treasury. That means she's essentially as uh, Treasury's point person for making sure our financial system cannot be exploited by adversaries, be they criminals, terrorists, or other countries. Um, I'll say this is uh, not the first time she's worked in this space. She's actually had a long and distinguished career, uh, including a couple of stints as senior advisor within other parts of Treasury working on these issues. She also spent several years as a senior fellow at the Center for New American Security. In fact, I think she and I met, I think it was right around the start of the pandemic when all of this uh, chaos was happening around digital identity uh, in her role at CNAS doing a, a great uh, 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 forum uh, on that side of things. But uh, really thrilled she could come speak with us today. So Assistant Secretary, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jeremy. Uh, and thank you uh, to the Better, Di Better Identity Coalition, the FIDO Alliance, and the Identity Theft Resource Center for inviting me today. It's really a pleasure to help close out this forum. And as you noted, Jeremy, in your very kind introduction, I have had the ability to, to approach this set of topics from outside of government and from inside. And um, it continues to be uh, challenging, interesting work. So I have a couple of thoughts that I had prepared to share with you today. And I wanna start by sharing an observation I've made since uh, joining this administration last year. Many of the critical problems plaguing our financial system stem from an inability to readily and reliably know who we're dealing with. So whether we're talking about people who shouldn't have access to the financial system like money launderers, criminals, and those under sanctions, or those who should be able to access the financial system but who are excluded for various reasons, we're often talking about identity problems. So for example, when the pandemic started spreading widely, and um, I, Jeremy, you invoked it in your introduction, but we all, of course, remember that moment well. Um, thinking back to March 2020, uh, when Congress, as you all will all probably remember, uh, Congress passed the CARES Act. That bill, among other things, provided expanded unemployment insurance for millions of people that COVID had put out of a job. And within two months, however, an international cyber criminal ring saw an opportunity. They applied for unemployment benefits using stolen personal identifiable information, PII, of citizens of Washington state. And within weeks, their scheme crossed the borders into Arizona, Hawaii. By the end of July, they had swindled the federal government out of potentially millions of dollars. And unfortunately, it wasn't an isolated case. The Department of Justice has charged hundreds of defendants in stealing COVID-related relief funds. There are also the people in another example um, who should have access to the financial system, but who don't. So survivors of human tracking, human trafficking, excuse me, for instance, we know one of the first things that traffickers do is strip their victims of their phones and IDs. They deprive them of their identity evidence which means that when survivors finally gain their freedom, they emerge into a world with little ability to navigate it. They can't get a driver's license, they can't get a bank account. And that's only one very specific example. While many factors contribute to financial exclusion, too many people in this country lack easy access to the government issued identity documents that are traditionally required to open a bank account. Rarely in public policy discussions, do complex problems have simple solutions? And indeed, this is the part of the speech where someone in my position usually makes a caveat and says, our challenges require a constellation of actions. Or there's no one silver bullet. But actually, in the cases that I've described and in so many others, there really is a kind of a silver bullet, at least one of the closest things to it that I've seen in public policy making, and that's digital ID. Of course, integrating digital identity solutions presents technical challenges, to be sure, but it seems clear to me that as a policy matter, digital ID has the potential to immediately and dramatically improve how we protect our national security and our financial security. In fact, there's a coda to the stolen pandemic benefit story I was mentioning earlier, when some of the states such as Arizona recognized that they were being defrauded, they partnered with the digital ID company called ID.me, 
Almost immediately, the fraud ring saw the game was up. Here's a quote. Do you not understand PUA, also known as Pandemic Unemployment Assistance, is dead? One hacker posted on a dark web forum. Another quote, all the states are switching over to ID me. But unfortunately, such anecdotes are still more the exception than the rule. The physical world is quickly merging with the digital world. Assets are digital, payments are digital, loan applications and disbursements are digital. The way we interact with institutions like banks and our government is increasingly digital. And yet our framework for identity proofing is still an artifact of a time when we would go to the bank and show the teller our driver's license in order to take out cash. This has created an explosion of the problems like the ones I described and something that you all know well. These problems include everything from the mildly frustrating, think about how often we're asked to prove that we're not robots on the internet, to the endangerment of our national security. Here I'm talking about hackers spoofing identities to launch ransomware attacks on government IT systems, on our hospitals, on our pipelines, and on other critical infrastructure. And we also see how kleptocrats and other international criminals evade our sanctions by hiding behind false identities and empty shell companies. This is a road we simply cannot continue to travel if we do not treat digital ID solutions and digital ID infrastructure as basic public goods. If we do not rapidly implement them, then bad actors will increasingly exploit our inability <clears throat> to know who we're dealing with. They may even have more opportunities to commit fraud, money laundering, sanctions evasion, and cybercrime. They will cheat and violate the laws and regulations that are the bedrock of our society. And indeed, a society where you cannot trust that you actually know who someone is, is a very broken society. Treasury understands the efficiency, equity, and national security issues associated with our lack of a strong privacy preserving digital identity ecosystem in this country. But now we must bring greater urgency and energy to solve the problem. Now we must better support industry, institutions, and all levels of government to innovate and implement interoperable digital identity technology and services. And today my message first and foremost is that's exactly what we're doing. At Treasury, we're approaching 2022 as a year of action for digital ID, a period in which we're going to undertake a series of measures to ensure that technology can be adopted as broadly as possible, as quickly as possible. So what will those actions be? Uh, what will this digital ID ecosystem look like? And just as important, what won't it look like? And I'll tick through a few characteristics now. <clears throat> First, I wanna be really clear. We're not talking about a national digital identity uh, system here, an official database of everyone's personal uh, in information housed in some federal agency. We don't have that now, and this administration won't propose creating one in the future. In this country, as you all know, much of the key information that can validate identity is held by the states and communities where you live. It's in driver's license and birth certificate files, and that won't change. Second, our digital ID ecosystem won't be monolithic. There are a variety of ways digital identity solutions can be credibly val can credibly validate identity attributes and verify the identity of a unique person. This means that there shouldn't be one digital ID technology or just one platform. We're talking about a diversity of technologies and services here, and it's the federal government's role not to pick just one but to ensure that many of them can be developed and interact with each other. Indeed, all levels of government and the private sector must play a role in creating a secure, privacy-preserving, consent-based ecosystem built on open standards. One way we'll do that is through clear communication. This is the third characteristic I wanna highlight of the digital ID ecosystem we're building. If we wanna drive more innovation and adoption, we know government can't be vague in its guidance or half-hearted in its support. We recognize that there's significant work already underway by financial institutions and the technology industry to advance digital identity technology and solutions. At the same time, we look forward to working with the federal banking regulators and US government agencies on creating the right environment for digital ID solutions. 
I think clear regulation and supervisor expectations can really help drive digital ID adoption in the financial sector, including in the rapidly growing digital asset space. As we have consistently emphasized, digital, assets provi digital asset providers need to comply with the Bank Secrecy Act in the same way traditional financial service providers do. Digital identity solutions can help them do that. Fourth point, the effectiveness of digital identity solutions and services depends on the ability to validate identity attributes against authoritative government databases. To do that, we're pushing to open up more databases. That means digitizing local and state databases and developing appropriate infrastructure and applications such as mobile driver's license infrastructure that can support privacy preserving identity attribute validation services. We're exploring the possibility of voluntary grants to help states do that. There are also new databases at Treasury that Treasury can make useful, including one we're creating on beneficial ownership. Since the early 20th century, some states have allowed anybody to establish a shell company without disclosing who really owns it, what we term the beneficial owner. That's about to change, actually. Thanks to Treasury's Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, or FinCEN, we're now in the process of implementing the Corporate Transparency Act. A big bipartisan majority of Congress passed the law last year, and it mandates the creation of a national database of who owns what company. Last month, FinCEN issued a proposed rule to collect the necessary information that will help us build this database. It will require many US and foreign companies to report their true beneficial owners to FinCEN and to update that information when those beneficial owners change. Finally, and maybe the most important, any digital ID solution needs to protect people's privacy. Privacy protection is already a core element of the NIST Digital Identity Guidelines, Technical Standards, and Trust Framework, which was crafted to increase the ability to include privacy-enhancing techniques as a fundamental element elements of identity systems. And for uh, the American public, excuse me, and privacy is enshrined in our federal financial sector regulatory regime. For the American people to trust digital identity, they must be able to trust that it affords them privacy. Like the rest of you, I don't want us to be addressing the same problems with ne when next year's forum convenes. At least I don't want to see the same problems happening as frequently to the same degree as they are right now. The 2023 forum should be a moment to celebrate progress, a time when we can look around the financial services sector and see a bigger set of di digital identity validation and verification solutions available. Treasury is committed to making that happen, but let me close by saying this, we cannot do it alone. We need the private sector's help. We need your help in particular. We need you not just to build these technologies, but to work with us to ensure they are broadly implemented, to engage with the federal government, with states and communities, with privacy advocates, everyone who has a stake in this issue. And we need you through diligent, collaborative, and painstakingly credible work to give the American public confidence that the digital identity solutions are secure, voluntary, protect their privacy, and keep the bad guys out. And if we do that, then I'm confident we won't be living with a financial sector where more and more cyber criminals steal people's identities or synthesize new ones, where crime rings rob good people and defraud financial institutions, businesses, and the American taxpayer. Instead, we'll be living in a world with less digital fraud and fewer stolen identities, with stronger defenses against ransomware attacks, a world where all of us feel safer trusting an individual on the other side of our computer because we know who they are. And with that, I will end my remarks and thank you very much. Hey, thank you. I really appreciate you coming. I know schedule wise, just as said, you didn't have time for questions. I'll just say, uh, I love the idea of 2022 as a year of action. I definitely don't want to have the same conversation next year. And so uh, we'll look forward to working with you. Uh, really appreciate you coming today. Thank you so much. And we'll take a, a brief break. Uh, our closing keynote will be Carol House from the White House National Security Council staff. Uh, she, she's scheduled to come on 245. So we'll break for another uh, 10 minutes or so, and then we'll 
have Carol come on and wrap up with uh, closing comments. So we'll be back shortly. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>